Good morning, everyone. So nice that the sun is out and the roads are relatively clear. It's so good to see all of you. Um, before I forget, any of you who weren't here last week, we do have uh, some Linton packets, just like the uh, Advent ones that we had um, back in December. And we... Uh, they just released um, the script for an Easter pageant, just like the Christmas one that we did. So uh, I'll be getting in touch with the families, um, hopefully with a little more time this time around, um, to, to see if the kids are interested in, in uh, I was going to say acting up, but that's something else. So, um, so uh, we, we'll have that. Are there any other announcements? It seems so weird to be in Lent and not talking about fish fries, but um, any announcements anyone has? All right. Then let us join in our call to worship. To you, O God, we lift up the spirit of our whole selves. O God, we trust you. May we begin our Lenten journey together in right relationships. Teach us, show us, guide us your paths. Grow us to know your ways more clearly. You are the God of our salvation and the sustainer of good relations. May integrity, a clean conscience, and upright living preserve us. Let us pray. As in days of old, Creator God, we come to look for you signs of covenant promises. Like the rainbow days of Noah, we see and know your signs and hear your voice again, directing us to places of preparation and transformation in our lives and in our world. Thank you, God, for your covenant signs in this season of Lent. Amen. Um, before we have our first music, um, also, one other item to remind, um, as it says in the bulletin, we will not be in person here next Sunday. Um, we have a recorded service that a bunch of the different UCC churches in the area are preparing, and I will be posting the, the recording on Facebook and YouTube and sending it out um, by the normal channels. Um, and so you can... Uh, hear and see from a bunch of people in the area. Part of the thought behind this was that normally this time of year we would be having our one of our association meetings, and those often involve worship, and many people like being able to worship and join together, and we aren't meeting in person right now, so this is a way to do something. So um, I will be sending that information out um, probably on Saturday. Um, so now our first song recorded is called Acceptable to You.
The words of that song were, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. My friend Kim, um, when she posted it on her YouTube channel, commented that she sort of had, you know, a little bit of a raucous, almost, you know, Western saloon kind of style. So that, that, that was sort of the background of that. Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the sun, sunshine this morning. We thank you for the reminders that this winter season will not last forever. We pray this morning for those who are sick, particularly all those who are sick or have been sick with COVID, all those who are affected by quarantines, all those affected by business loss due to the pandemic. We pray for those who are waiting for surgery, for Robin and Dodi. We pray for those who mourn, particularly this week for Roberta's family. We pray for all the people in Texas who have had damage or disruption because of the storms. We pray that we might find ways to better care for everyone in our country and help them be better prepared for, for events like this. Lord, help us remember that our responsibilities to each other extend beyond our own families, beyond our neighborhoods or states, that we are, as part of your creation, responsible to care for all of your creatures, all of your children. And Lord, help us to remember your promises and the responsibilities those promises call us to uphold. We pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 9, God's promises to Noah. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is in the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. <coughs> Our second reading comes from Genesis chapter 17, God's covenant with Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Avram, but your name shall be Avraham for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. 
I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarai shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And finally, from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. So our texts today relate in part to the beginning of the season of Lent, which may feel a little bit early this year because it is earlier than often. And so that's why we have the reading from Mark about Jesus going into the wilderness. But our texts also speak of covenant. Covenant is a word that doesn't actually get used as much anymore. In its root, it can in one sense just be a contract. And everybody loves contracts, except when they want to get out of the long, long contract with Verizon or whatever. But a contract doesn't fully get out what a covenant is talking about. I mean, in one sense, it is a contract in the sense that most contracts describe the responsibilities of the parties in the contract. They describe the expected behavior, the results of someone violating that contract. But to say that God has a covenant with us actually elevates that relationship, particularly when you look specifically at the covenants in the Bible. In the Bible, the covenants there, scholars have found mirror and echo the covenants that ancient peoples made with their kings. And in this case, when you look at the words of the covenant, it's that God is playing the role, in a sense, of the kings in the same kinds of promises that people made to their kings and their kings made to them, God and the people of Israel are making. But the thing here that is important is that the covenants in the Bible are not, well, are, are more than contracts as we look at them now, because, of course, as I said, when whether you're talking about a utility provider, whether you're talking about a, a phone service, whether you're talking about a job in many cases, we do experience the end of covenants, the end of contracts. But God's covenants presented in the Bible are eternal. When God makes the promise to Noah, and interestingly, you know, every now and then as I'm reading the texts in church, something pops out at me that I hadn't really noticed before. When God presents the sign of the rainbow to Noah as a reminder of the contract, it's not just to Noah. It's not just to people to say, when you see that rainbow, remember God's promise. It says that it's there as a reminder to God, that God somehow needs a reminder of that promise. I'm not sure what to make of that. But I would note that God says, I will never again destroy the earth by a flood. 
There's no asterisk. There's none of that wonderful fine print at the bottom that says, well, if X, Y, and Z happen, well, then all bets are off. It says, no, I will never again. God then makes a covenant with Abraham. Actually, backing up for a second, that covenant with Noah is with everybody. All of Noah's descendants, and in fact, all of life, all the animals and the descendants of the animals that came off the ark. With everyone. And then as Genesis moves forward and God makes the promises to Abraham, that covenant is narrowed just to Abraham's descendants. But again, there's no, there's no escape clause on either side. There's no escape clause that says, well, Abraham, if you get tired of me, you can break this contract and go follow other gods. And there's no escape clause for God. God's covenant is eternal. Then later on, God makes the covenant with Moses. A continuation of the promises to Abraham, but now giving details of God's promises and God's relationship with the people of Israel. And in that one, now there are consequence clauses. Again, just like some of those wonderful, you know, well, there there are possible late fees or all those kinds of things. But again, there's no clause about God terminating that covenant. Instead, part of the covenant with Moses, says even when you sin, even when the people sin and forget this covenant, when they repent, I will restore the relationship. And then later David receives promises from God that David's descendants will always rule in Jerusalem. Later on, there is not a new covenant, but a sort of reimagining of the covenant in the promises to Jeremiah that the covenants will not be written on stone, as in the Ten Commandments, but will be written on people's hearts, that they will experience and and remember God's covenant eternally, internally. And then finally, for Christians, Jesus is a continuation of that covenant. And so this idea of covenant is central to the Bible. Central and on grand scale. We didn't read the specific section in Genesis, but as God goes on, God says that Abraham's descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand in the sea. And I think the point is to say that you can't count them at all, any more than any of us could count the stars in the sky. And I suspect after about 50 of saying, well, this one, this one, this one, you kind of lose count. And certainly that happens with the sand in the sea. As I say, this is a permanent covenant. The relationship, the details of it develop, but it persists. And it still persists despite human failure. Despite what we see in the Bible of many delays in the fulfillment of those promises. In one sense, much of the Bible is an ongoing back and forth between some of the promises seeming to be fulfilled, and then some of them being endangered. So when the Israelites experienced slavery in Egypt, and they wondered, where is God? Has God forgotten us? God did fulfill that covenant. When David's descendants were no longer ruling in Jerusalem, some people wondered, whether that meant that God 
had given up on them. And they kept hoping, they kept looking. In some senses, this is a tension between the way the world is and how it should be or how it could be. And when the world does not, and our experiences of the world do not live up to those promises, sometimes it's natural to want to blame God. But I think it's also important to acknowledge our own role. Whether we're talking about family relationships or communities or larger scale, sometimes those relationships do not live up to our hope. And some, sometimes there are factors beyond our control. If we had known exactly what was going to happen in this last year, I'd like to think that in many ways we could have handled it differently. But then there are snowstorms. There are, and, and my friends in Texas have certainly been um, sharing some scary stories. Also sharing a little bit of frustration. I mean, I, I get the sort of jokes and understanding, you know, you know, every time you hear about some community in another part of the country that they get half an inch of snow and they close school because nobody can drive on the roads. I, I, I get that. But at the same time, the stories and the damage, you know, when, when, when you don't ever expect a storm of this magnitude, you don't insulate your pipes and you don't put them in a place where they're easy to keep warm. Um, apparently, a lot of people in Texas don't even have shutoff valves by their house. It's buried in the dirt by the street. And so that has complicated the efforts. That also brings up the fact that not just that, that we do not just have a covenant with God, in a sense, we have covenants with each other. And sometimes those covenants. We only remember them or think about them when they fail. When the people that we thought we could trust or the services we thought we would be there are no longer there. And, and I'm, I'm trying to, to avoid political statements, but if you've heard the news about the uh, power utilities in Texas, apparently the policies were set up in a way that definitely benefited the utilities and not the users of the utilities, because as the power started coming back on, people were finding that they were getting $16,000 utility bills because the power companies had the chance to change the rate on the spot based on the need. Um, a power bill like that will... will bankrupt just about anybody. When we have things like power companies, when we have medical services, when we have police and fire and other services, no one necessarily likes paying taxes, but some of these things are what we pay taxes for. And we expect to be able to have them. And we have them because they're serving the public. But then when they're set up in a way that does not serve the public, but serves just the owners, that is a legitimate time to question and say, is this how it should be? How much control do any of us have over those kinds of things? As I say, the political issues, and to a certain extent, it's Texas, so the residents of Texas need to deal with that. But it's a reminder to all of us that when we live in community, we do have responsibility to other people. The gospel reading reminds us that at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus went into the wilderness. And I've talked about this, I mentioned it a little bit last week as well, that this idea of the wilderness 
is a powerful symbol in the Bible because on the one hand, the people struggled and wandered in the wilderness. And in many ways in the Bible, the wilderness is a symbol of what is dangerous. It's outside of civilization. There are wild beasts out there. There are outlaws out there. And so going into the wilderness is a dangerous place, a dangerous thing. And yet at the same time, at many points in the Bible, people encounter God in the wilderness. I think it's a fair question to ask, why do people have to go away to encounter God? Even even now, many people like going camping, going out to national parks, going into the wilderness. And it can be a nice way to escape from certain things, although I know then if you're going camping in the wilderness, the question is, well, just how extreme camping are you going to be? And do you then have to bring your air mattress and all other kinds of things? That's a whole other topic for another day. But the point is that Jesus went into the wilderness to pray, but into a symbolically dangerous place. The Bible also says that he was tempted there. in that it, this time prepared him for his ministry. We don't necessarily need to go into the wilderness, but we can work, and this is what some people do in terms of giving things up for Lent, to try to remove the, some of the distractions, to try to intentionally make room, make space, make the ability to listen for God. As I said in the service for Wednesday night, some of the symbols for many people for Lent are ashes and fasting. It was never a really big part of my own family practice growing up. At school, my classmates would start conversations of, well, I'm giving up chocolate milk for Lent. What are you giving up? And there would always be the one smart aleck who would say, well, I'm going to stop hitting my, my kid brother. I'm not sure. I mean, that, that's a good thing to stop, but I'm not sure, quite sure that's the, the spirit of the process. Ashes and even the saying that is often said at Ash Wednesday, you know, from dust you came and from du- to dust you shall return, they're a reminder of our mortality. But this year, I don't think many of us really need a reminder of our mortality. And for some people, the idea of going to church or even just listening to an Ash Wednesday service to be reminded of mortality is almost more that they can bear. Making sacrifices at Lent. Most of us have already had to make sacrifices this year in canceling events and disrupting routines. And the idea of isolation, going away, going away from distractions. Well, so many people have already felt isolation in having to stay home and not being able to see friends. And so, to a certain extent, I'm hesitant to just focus on these images of mortality and of sacrifice. But I think... As I said on Wednesday, in, the, in the recording on Wednesday, we can also think of these in the sense of transformation. So fire brings heat and light, and certainly in this time of year, many people who have fireplaces in their homes like having a fire because it helps bring the heat. Fire can also bring destruction. And yet, even after destruction, life can come back. So in the last few years, there have certainly been many images you've probably seen of the forest fires in many places in the country. And sometimes left to itself, those forests do start to grow back. 
In fact, in some cases, some of these seeds will only start to grow once there's been a fire. Not that I want to take that analogy too far to say that we should all welcome fire and destruction, but it's a reminder to us that even when we face destruction, even when we face the disruption of everything we've hoped for, life can still come back. There are some churches this season that are using the image of sea glass. And I I don't know about you, whenever I go to the beach, I like walking along the shore and finding those little pieces of glass that have been smoothed and uh, particularly sometimes trying to find the unusual colors. You know, you find lots of white glass. Actually, these pieces that I had at home um, are part of, you know, must have come from some kind of reinforced glass because I can see the wires inside them. Clearly, it wasn't reinforced enough. Um, they, They broke. But over time, something that is broken and actually, in fact, had at one point sharp edges that could have hurt somebody, gets transformed by the action of the waves, turning something that was broken and damaged and useless into something beautiful. And that happens with the rocks as well. Or, in this case, this was a piece of some kind of pottery or something. And down at Lake Erie, we find lots of pieces of bricks. Um, Unfortunately, you also sometimes find other kinds of trash on the beach as well. That's a whole other story. And I'm hesitant, as I've often said, I'm hesitant to say that God is causing suffering, that God wants us to suffer. But I do believe that when we face suffering, we can find ways to keep going. We can find ways to transform that into something that is a sign of new life, that is a sign of beauty. And I've certainly seen lots of encouraging signs this year. For some people, it was trying to find a new hobby or exercising or cooking or baking. A lot of people were doing um, sourdough starter apparently this year. Um, When we were in Indiana, someone gave us one of those Amish friendship bread things and that lasted a couple months, but you know, it really was getting out of control. Trying to find more, more and more people who were willing to take little Amish friendship bread starters was, you know, also a difficulty. But for some people, 2020 was just a matter of trying to survive. And that's okay too. But I think it's also a reminder for us that when we face a situation like this, we're facing it together and we can work to support those who are vulnerable. We can work to support those who are struggling. As I was reading the passages for today about the covenant and remembering the statements that God makes about Abram's descendants becoming more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea, I thought of a poem that I learned when I was in Israel. It's been set to music, um, but the music is copyrighted, so I'm not going to put it in the video. I will put the link on Facebook um, and also my voice is a bit froggy, so you probably don't want me trying to sing. In Hebrew, it says, Eli, Eli, shalo yigamer ha'olam, ha'chol v'hayam, rishrush ha'mayim, barak ha'shamayim, tfilat ha'adam. My God, my God, I pray that these things never end. The sand in the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayers of our hearts. God made covenants back then that still extend and continue today. The rainbow, the stars in the sky, the sand in the sea are reminders of those covenants. And our 
end of the covenant is also still possible. For us to continue to follow God, to continue to try to serve and support those in our community and around the world, and to pray and stay in relationship and listen for God. This is something we can do all year long, but is particularly something we are challenged to try to do and remember during Lent. And our closing song um, is some harp music. The musician um, has arranged with the New York Conference of the United Church of Christ, and each week during Lent, she's going to share a recording. And so this is the first one. Um, I will put the link on in the email because you'll be able to hear the music, but you won't really be able to see the video because of the light. Not that I'm complaining with the sunlight this morning. So um, let us let us listen to this first harp piece called Beloved. Mindful of your mercy, forgiveness, and instruction, O God, let us go into the world renewed, refreshed, and full of courage to be your people. Let us go in peace to work for justice. Amen. And all God's people said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.